Hello, my name is Dr. Monica Patel. I'm a chronic pain physician at the University of Florida in Jacksonville. Welcome to our educational series. Today we're going to discuss living with chronic pain. This lecture was developed with funding from the Florida Blue Foundation and Florida Medical Malpractice Joint Underwriting Association. For more information, please visit pami.emergency.med.jax.ufl.edu. Our agenda includes overview of common pain conditions, multimodal treatment, and prevention of adverse events, as well as available resources for patients. So what is chronic pain? Chronic pain is pain that's been going on for several months to years. Oftentimes there's initial tissue injury and that tissue injury may heal within a expected amount of time, but the pain just never really goes away. How does pain affect us? So pain is multifactorial in nature. There are many components that contribute to how we experience pain. And that includes the physical, psychological, social, and spiritual influences. And it may also be related to genetics, age, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomics, psychiatric factors, including catastrophizing, culture, religion, previous experiences that may have um, may have led to an increased pain experience, patients' perceptions, ex expectations, etc. So pain affects everybody in a unique way due to all of these multifactorial contributions. How many of you have heard of Arthur? My friend Arthur. And what Arthur is, is osteoarthritis. So on rainy days or cold days, Arthur tends to visit. And what osteoarthritis is, is a very common um, wear and tear of the joints, and it can affect multiple joints. And when that happens, there's a thinning of the cushioning or cartilage between the joints and a chronic inflammatory state or Inflammation is also known as swelling and heat on the joint. So osteoarthritis joint pain affects the joints that we move the most. Um, that includes the knee, the hip, shoulder. There's many diagnostic evaluations that can be done, including ultrasound, x-ray, MRI, and from a pain perspective, what we do in our clinic is after you've tried conservative therapies, if your pain is continuing, then we can do different kinds of nerve blocks or joint injections, which are briefly depicted here. You can also have arthur of the spine or osteoarthritis of the spine joints. That's called facet arthropathy and spondylosis also a form of osteoarthritis. So in the spine, you have small joints. They're about the size of your knuckles. And you have a column on the right, a column on the left that starts at the base of your head and goes all the way down to your um, lower back. And when there's arthritis in those joints, the joint space narrows as well as the joint can overgrow and when that happens, one vertebrae can slide in front of the other, and that's called spondylosis. What we do in our pain clinic is we do different types of nerve blocks to block the sensation of pain from those joints, and that is depicted here. We use a fluoroscopy machine, also known as an x-ray machine, to do that. So how many of you have said, oh, my back just gave out on me? You were gardening, you were shoveling, whatever it may be. Maybe you just woke up one morning and your back just was not cooperative and you were unable to really 
do much for an extended period of time. Well, that can also be caused by something called a disc degeneration. So in between each of the bones in the spine, you have a jelly-filled donut, I like to call it. So it has a jelly inside and a hard outer shell. Okay, the jelly inside is called the nucleus pulposa, which is depicted here. And the, um, the outside of the donut is called the annulus fibrosis. And what happens is, is that as we age, the jelly can dry out and that disc space can get smaller and the bones can get a little bit closer together. Or if they're in other situations, the jelly can herniate out. That's called a disc herniation. And when that happens, you'll have a, a bulge or protrusion of the disc into the area where the nerves exit. And that can cause pain in the neck, pain in the lower back, and it can also have associated arm or leg pain depending on the nerve that is being encroached or um, has pressure on it from that disc. And as you can see, here's a side view of an MRI showing where that disc herniation is. What we do in our pain clinic for that typically is called an epidural steroid injection. There's a few techniques for that, um, but basically you're bathing the nerve with an anti-inflammatory medication and the, the epidural space is the outer coating of that nerve. If you like to think about a, um, an electrical cord, you have, if you cut the electrical cord in half, you'll notice that the inside has the silver wires, those are your nerves, and the outside is usually a colorful rubber coating. And where we put the medication for any type of epidural injection is similar to that rubber coating that's outside of the nerves, um, but is a sheath around the nerves. And that can provide short to long-term pain relief depending on the severity of the nerve injury or compression upon that nerve. Now, one thing that can happen pretty commonly is a fall especially with, with um, certain risk factors such as aging, such as not having as good balance or as much core strength. And when that happens, you can get a broken bone. And it can be significant if you have also osteoporosis or thinning of the bones. The one that can be very painful if not all of them, is a vertebral compression fracture. And that's depicted on the screen here. So if you think about your spine, the bony part of your spine is made up of squares, which are vertebral bodies, and those are building blocks stacked one on top of each other from the lower back all the way to the neck and there. They support your body weight. Oftentimes when you fall, if you have osteoporosis or a significant trauma, that um, square shape gets compressed to either a triangle shape or a, a thinner rectangular shape. And that can um, change the actual um, alignment of the spine so that now you're gonna be leaning a little bit more forward because those building blocks, instead of having a bunch of squares, have a triangle or a wedge shape incorporated where the broken bone is. Also can have a hip fracture, a wrist fracture if you're falling on an outstretched hand or an ankle fracture if you've twisted your, um, your leg significantly. And I do find that a lot of times walking the dog can put, put patients at risk for falls just because the dog may run one way and the leash may be pulling in another way and the coordination and balance is off and that can, can um, lead to falls. A very common injury is also a muscle strain uh, or often call, oftentimes called a pooled muscle. And that can happen if you're lifting or carrying objects or if you 
sort of fell asleep in the wrong position and woke up um, with a sore neck or sore back. Um, so typically muscle fibers are laying flat one on top of each other and that's the position that works the best for contracting the muscle, shortening the muscle so that you have good use of the muscle. But what happens when there's a pulled muscle or a muscle strain, those muscles get sort of balled up and tangled. So there are conservative treatments with stretching and ice, but if, if that muscle strain or muscle pull isn't improving after two to three weeks of conservative treatment, then I would recommend doing a trigger point injection where the, um, the muscle is injected with this very fine needle, and the needle's vibrated, and it sort of resets the muscle fibers, and that um, can help realign it back into the flat position where each of the fibers are laying straight across each other and can be stretched and iced, and that can improve. I also have overuse injuries, so overuse, particularly in the hand from knitting or from other activities that re require fine motor movements can really lead to overuse injuries. So these are also called tendonitis. Um, in the hand particularly, very commonly it's de Quervain tenosynovitis where there's an overuse injury of the thumb tendons that are used for many activities. Other overuse injuries include trigger finger, um, in where the fingers will become locked in a position. You have to basically use your other hand to straighten it out, and that can be very painful as well. In the elbow, you can have medial or lateral epicondylitis, where you have an overuse injury of your wrist, and that will lead to actually elbow pain. And there's various bracing options for that, which are depicted here. And if that doesn't improve, then you can also have um, injection therapy or physical therapy, occupational therapy. Another set of pathologies that lead to chronic pain are from nerve injuries. So patients that have had amputations due to limb circulation problems such as peripheral vascular disease which can also happen with you know um, uncontrolled diabetes or with significant infections that aren't healing can have a traumatic amputation as well from heavy machinery or a car accident and that residual limb you can have a painful feeling so even though the limb isn't there you still feel like it's there and it's in pain. Can also have a neuroma, which is a nerve collection at the end of the um, residual limb. And that can be very painful, particularly if any pressure is placed on it. So there's treatment options for that, including medications, nerve injections, as well as um, physical therapy, mirror imaging. Um, other types of nerve injuries include complex regional pain syndrome. It's a very rare injury or syndrome. However, it typically happens post-surgically. Post it can also happen from a very minor crush or minor injury that um, leads to a increase in pain, particularly in a hand or a foot, and it'll cause increased redness, swelling. Um, there'll be skin changes like increased sweating or hair loss, um, loss of range of motion in the joints and very significant pain with just light touch of clothing or wind on the affected limb. And what's done from our perspective for that is we do different types of nerve blocks, medication therapies, as well as um, physical therapy 
as well to improve the range of motion, strength, and conditioning of the limb. There's also nerve injuries that are um, peripheral nerve injuries. And these are typically nerve, nerves that are at the um, hands or feet, and that follows a stocking or glove distribution. That can happen with diabetes, like a diabetic neuropathy, or with toxin exposures, or with thyroid issues. There's also peripheral nerve injuries that can happen with the ilioinguinal nerve. So that is um, in the groin, can have groin pain. That can happen sometimes after a hernia surgery repair. You can also have trigeminal nerve or facial pain, which can happen um, sort of spontaneously on one side of the face, or it can happen after dental procedures. What's most important is that for any chronic pain condition, there's multimodal care. So medications, as well as lifestyle changes to reduce tension and stress. So tension and stress has been correlated with increased pain. So if you are undergoing um, some significant loss of a family member or a job or financial stress, or other health issues that are increasing your stress, that can also increase your pain experience. Like we had said earlier, it's a multifactorial experience and lifestyle um, changes to reduce tension and stress can be very beneficial. You can try ice or heat. Um, for swelling, you really want to try ice and for sort of chronic long-term sort of muscle aches and pains you can use heat it's important to get regular exercise and that might look different depending on your activity level from just doing passive stretching or active stretching to having a daily walking program to actually having a gym program or a swimming program proper nutrition is very important particularly when thinking about um, anti-inflammatory type foods in the diet, as well as um, maintaining a healthy body weight. Um, adequate sleep is also very important. Um, the body is meant to sleep a certain number of hours every night, and that regulates different hormone levels in the body that helps us feel good. And when sleep is interrupted or inadequate, then that can cause a dysregulation in the body, which can also influence pain and pain experience. And so if there is some sort of sleep disorder, it's good to have that evaluated and treated. Other things that can help with pain reduction include yoga, which helps stretch, and meditation, which helps with breathing and oxygenation and um, reduction in stress. So as a pain management specialist, we like to use a comprehensive approach with um, first evaluation of imaging, the mechanism of injury, prior treatments, different types of interventional techniques if conservative treatment has failed, as well as collaborating with our therapists, um, medications, including adjuvant treat treatments, which would be medications that help reduc reduce pain when they're um, combined together, and pain palliation modalities, which can be done um, by the therapist as well as um, at home programs. Now we're gonna talk about prevention, and prevention means preventing bad things from happening. Um, so that would be injuries as well as adverse effects from treatments. So let's talk about the opioid medications, which can lead to um, adverse effects if they're not taken properly or in, com in combination of other medications. So you have short-acting opioids 
and there's a list there, codeine, tramadol, tapentanol, hydrocodone, oxycodone, morphine, and hydromorphone, as well as long-acting opioids, buprenorphine, fentanyl, morphine extended release, and oxycodone extended release, and methadone. And so all of these medications share a similar side effect profile, which can be making you sleepy, confused, as well as having constipation. And if not taken as prescribed or in combination of other medications or while you're acutely ill with a serious condition, it can cause respiratory depression and accidental death. So if you're feeling any of these symptoms, um, sleepiness, confusion, bad dreams, hallucinations, constipation, sweating, nausea, vomiting, itching, dry mouth, it's really important for you to contact your doctor so that they can make recommendations on how you should be taking your medications. Um, other things that may happen, there is an increased risk of falls if you're feeling confused or sleepy. You can also develop an addiction or dependence on these medications, respiratory depression, which can be exacerbated if you already have a respiratory condition, and then accidental overdose, which can lead to death. So all of these things I like to think of as a fire burning. And you know, it can start out small, but then it can quickly escalate into a significant fire. And so what we do to combat that is our naloxone nasal spray, which can also be um, formulated as an intramuscular injection, but the nasal spray is now more commonly prescribed and covered by the insurance carriers. It's also available over the counter at the local drugstore and it's a fire extinguisher. So just like your fire extinguisher at home, you may never use it, but at the same time, you wanna make sure that you have it in case you need it. So it's important to educate yourself and the loved ones on its emergency use. Basically, if you are feeling any of those symptoms where you're having difficulty breathing or confusion or um, you're not as responsive as you should be, based on the people around you. It's a little small device that is just sprayed into the nose. Depending on how it's prescribed, it may have one or two uses per device. And that reverses the effects of the opioids for about 10 to 15 minutes, which is enough time for the ambulance to arrive and evaluate the situation and the ambulance has a, the ability to continue that medication if needed. However, it, just in the case of a fire, you may be able to extinguish the fire temporarily with your fire extinguisher. You still have to call the fire department and make sure that they check it out and make sure that the fire is under control. Just like that, when you use your Narcan nasal spray, you have to make sure that you still call 911 immediately and have um, that rescue support available for you. It can be life-saving and it can be used not only on yourself or with other family members or friends that may be needing it. So another prevention that is very important is fall prevention. So when thinking about your home or living space, you really want to look at the, the floor, the stairs, the bathroom. So in the floors, you want to remove loose rugs, have slip-free mats, remove cords or wires in common walking areas that might be trip hazards, repair any uneven floors, be mindful of wet floors. And if in this case of stairs, make sure that loose steps are replaced or repaired and that there's strong handrails on one or both sides so that you can um, hold on to that and prevent a fall. In the bathroom, having handrails in the bathtub, maybe a shower chair so that you can take a break if you've been standing for too long and slip free mats. And then oftentimes there's some vision impairments 
uh, which can be improved with improved lighting or eyeglasses and balance. Really want to make sure that you're not overreaching for items as that can lead you to get off balance and fall. Use a cane or a walker as indicated on your activity level. Wheelchair for long distances and then just core strengthening exercises. So our core muscles are what really hold us up and stop us from falling when we're um, in the process of falling, sort of realigns our balance and keeps us upright. Other resources that are helpful, uh, smoking is also a risk factor for increased pain because cig cigarette smoking changes our vasculature throughout our body, including the vasculature that supplies our joints. And so as that um, decreases, that also can increase onset of osteoarthritis and also increase our pain sensitivity. So reducing smoking um, can also improve pain and the can also provide some prevention and chronic pain development. Additionally, alcohol, when you think of drinking alcohol, you have to be very cognizant of the med medications that you're taking at the same time because alcohol, it can um, significantly impair your um, alertness and medications that interact with alcohol can be quite dangerous. So these handouts are on the PAMI website for further information and further resources for you on thinking about uh, smoking cessation or alcohol cessation. Additionally, on the PAMI website, they have a healthy eating plan that includes a balanced diet as well as anti-inflammatory foods, which are typically dark berries, green vegetables, lots of fruits and vegetables, um, whole grains, things like that, which you can read about more on the PAMI website. And they also have a resource on practicing relaxation to reduce pain on their website, like we had mentioned earlier. Stress management and increased relaxation also increases um, pain relief. So here are the references for your review. Um, the first three are educational textbooks and for patients the PAMI educational videos are on the website listed here pami.emergency.med.jax.ufl.edu backslash resources, backslash PAMI, dash education, dash pain, dash videos, backslash. I appreciate your time viewing this educational video. Take care.